Okay, hello everyone, welcome back to another video. So we've just hit 5,000 subscribers, so that's a huge thank you to everyone for all the support this channel's been getting. And the way we're going to celebrate is by uploading five consecutive videos, one each day uh, of the new year, starting with today. And we're going to do a classic today. We haven't done an integral in a while, and I found a really nice one. It's the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x sine x over 1 plus x squared with respect to x. And I'm sure there's all sorts of really interesting ways to solve this, and I'd love to see them down below in the comments. But the method we're going to be using today is contour integration and there's three things about this integral that suggest contour might be a way to go. The first thing um, is the denominator of the integrand. 1 plus x squared is of course something that's going to have poles or, or points at which it's undefined or kind of blows up to infinity at imaginary values of x, namely at i or at negative i, because of course at these points we end up with 1 plus i squared, which is 1 minus 1, which is 0, and we can't divide by 0 in maths. So that's a, a clue. Another clue is the bounds from negative infinity to positive infinity, because often when we're choosing contours um, to take our integral along, uh, it's very easy to choose ones that go along the entire real axis, and so it's obviously not all integrals that go from negative infinity to positive infinity as an indicator, but in uh, in tandem with the denominator and also with the fact that we have a trigonometric function in the numerator, a sine x, which can also be represented as the imaginary part of e to the ix, and of course I'm, I'm hoping everybody's come across Euler's identity, which is that e to the ix is equal to cos x plus i sine x, and due to the distributive property of the integral, if we take the imaginary part or, and replace sine x with e to the ix, we get the same thing. And so these three things together are all suggesting maybe there's something complex involved and maybe contour would be a good way to go about solving this. So the first thing we're going to do is define a complex valued function, a function of z, and that's equal to z e to the iz over 1 plus z squared, and we've already identified that we have poles when z equals i or z equals negative i. So let's capture this information on an argand diagram so that we can begin to choose the path that we want to take our contour through. So this is our imaginary axis, this is our real axis, and of course at the points one and minus one, we've got poles. Now don't forget that our, the integral we're interested in is the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity. So the, the strategy always with contour is to try and have a part of your contour capture um, the bounds that you are looking for in your integral and then hope that you can subtract out or by taking limits make other parts go to zero so that you're just left with your answer being uh, the part of the contour you're interested in. And I know that might sound a bit confusing but what I mean by that is we want the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of this function along the real axis. And so if I choose a contour that starts at negative r, goes to r, and circles back round on itself, then if I take the limit as r approaches infinity, I'm going to get my integral that I'm desiring, and all I have to do is hope that my integral that goes along this big curve either goes to zero or is something I can subtract out, and I can then use Cauchy's residue theorem to evaluate the integral on the contour as a whole. Now, you would expect uh, this curve part of the um, of the contour to go to zero, um, and we can use uh, Jordan's lemma for that, but we're going to prove it in this video anyway because it's good practice to uh, to do these things. So this is a great contour. I'm going to name this curved part gamma uh, just so we can keep track of it, and then we've got a part along the real axis, and of course we've captured a pole within our contour. So of course we can use Cauchy's residue theorem to evaluate the, uh, the integral along the whole contour, and it's not going to be too hard. We've only got to find the residue of the function at one pole because only one pole is captured with Within our contour and that's the pole when z is equal to i and this is equal to the limit as z approaches i of z minus i times the function. That's always how we calculate um, the residue easily with functions like this. Uh, we don't have to consider the Laurent series, we just multiply by z minus the pole and we take the limit as z approaches that pole. Now for us this is going to work so nicely and you'll see why. It's because if we actually write our function out uh, we're going to have some nice cancellation in our denominator because our denominator is 1 plus z squared but that can also be written as z plus i times z minus i. 
leads to some cancellation there and we are now free to take our limit. So as z approaches i, it's going to become i. As e to the i z, well as z approaches i, we're going to get e to the i times i, so it's going to be e to the negative 1. And we're going to be dividing by i plus i, which is 2i. And you can see our i's are going to cancel and we get left with just 1 over 2e as the residue at i. And we've got to multiply this by 2 pi i. And so that means that the integral along our contour is equal to 2 pi i multiplied by 1 over 2e, which gives us i pi over e. And if we go back to the original equation that we're considering, that means that what we're saying is that i pi over e is equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral from negative r to r of f of x dx plus our integral along gamma. And excuse me for a bit of uh, poor notation without actually writing the integrand out there. Uh, so now all we have to do really is evaluate gamma. Um, and we're going to do this via some parameterization. So let's consider what actually happens when we're taking our uh, limit along gamma. Well, our radius, the radius of all the complex numbers along this um, arc is constant and it's r, isn't it? It has to be r because it's negative r here and it's r here and it's centered at the origin. The only thing that varies as we move along this arc is our angle and it varies from zero to pi. So that means we're dealing with a complex number of the form r e to the i theta. So we let z equal r e to the i theta. Theta is varying from zero to pi and of course dz is going to be equal to i r e to the i theta, d theta. Okay, so now that we're comfortable with that parameterization, what I've done is I've just rewritten um, the integral that we were considering in terms of z, but I've replaced everything with our r e to the i thetas and our d thetas and so on. So this is z e to the i z over one plus z squared dz, but with all the terms replaced. And our goal here is to show that this goes to zero. And it's because that's gonna be easy for us if it does. And also we should have a suspicion that it does because generally um, parts of the contour that can be parameterized as, as semicircles uh, in the way that we've done by Jordan's lemma do go to zero, but we just wanna show it um, to make sure. So the first inequality we're gonna use in this proof, and it's all, this proof is all about inequalities, is that the absolute value of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. And that's something that would be quite interesting if you want to prove that below in the comments, but we don't have time to get into that today. So we're going to say that, first let's consider the absolute value of this whole integral. And this must be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value. Now we're definitely gonna need some more space to consider the next step here, but there's a lot of nice cancellation we can do, or at least there's some things we can eliminate. So firstly, we know the absolute value of i is equal to one, and we also know the absolute value of e to the i theta for any values of theta is always one. In this case, our r, or our distance from the origin, is always one, because we're just moving around the unit circle. So there's lots of nice things that we can get rid of in our numerator now. The absolute value of i, as we said, is 1. The absolute value of r squared is obviously just r squared because it's a real number approaching a very large number. The absolute value of e to the 2i theta is just 1. And when we're considering the absolute value of e to the i, r e to the i theta, it's not quite so simple as saying it's moving along the unit circle because this e to the i theta in the exponent is also complex. So there's some other things going on. So we're gonna expand our e to the i theta in the exponent here out as cos theta plus i sine theta, leaving us with e to the i r cos theta. And this is multiplied by e to the negative r sine theta, because we've got an i sine theta here multiplied by an i in our bracket. And the absolute value of e to the i r cos theta, well, that must be 1, because this is something that's moving along the unit circle. <clears throat> Whereas the absolute value of e to the negative r sine theta is just going to be e to the negative r sine theta, because, of course, no exponent can become negative, but this is not an imaginary thing. It's, it's got a magnitude. It's, it's a real number. So rewriting our integral, 
we've seriously cut down on what we had in our numerator. We can ignore our i, we've got an r squared, we can ignore our e to the 2i theta, and we've rewritten our exponent here. And so we're just going to end up with r squared e to the negative r sine theta. And of course, we've still got to consider our denominator because things are a little more complicated here because we've got addition rather than multiplication, right? But there's another inequality we can use here, and it's one called the reverse triangle inequality. It's one that tells us the absolute value of a minus b is always going to be greater than or equal to the absolute value of the absolute value of a minus absolute value of b. This is quite easy to prove. It's quite similar to the normal triangle inequality. But what we're going to do is take reciprocals here, and we're going to say, well, that means that 1 over the absolute value of a minus b must be less than or equal to 1 over the absolute value of the absolute value of a minus the absolute value of b. And if we rewrite our denominator here as 1 minus minus r squared e to the 2i theta, then we've got a denominator of this form. We've got a 1 minus, we've got an a minus b where a is 1 and b is negative r squared e to the 2i theta. And so we can safely say that this is less than or equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral from zero to pi of r squared e to the negative r sine theta divided by the absolute value of, well, the absolute value of one is one minus the absolute value of this term here. Well, we can ignore our negative. We can ignore our e to the two i theta, as we've already said. So we're just gonna end up with minus r squared like so. And now that we've gotten rid of all of our pesky exponentials. Let's just consider this for a second and common sense check. Well, r is approaching infinity, so 1 minus r squared is almost definitely going to be a negative number, which means when we take the absolute value, we're just going to end up with r squared minus 1. And this, well, we've got an r squared minus 1 and an r squared here, which is not anything to do with the variable of integration theta, so we can pull them out. So that's equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of r squared over r squared minus 1 times the integral from 0 to pi of e to the negative r sine theta d theta. Now this part of our integral is clearly just going to approach 1 because we can ignore negative 1 as r gets large and then we've just got r's which have the same power so they're going to grow at the same rate. So we can really ignore what we've got going on over here and we also have to consider the integrand. As r approaches infinity e to the negative r sine theta is going to become increasingly smaller and smaller and smaller because we've got more and more and more and more negative powers of e. So this is growing to essentially nothingness and so we have now shown that the absolute value of our integral along gamma must be less than or equal to zero as r goes to infinity. And if the absolute value is less than or equal to zero, and given that the absolute value cannot be less than zero, it must be equal to zero, which means that the integral as a whole must go to zero as r goes to infinity. So this is really nice for us, and we can now finally return to our equation to get the answer we're looking for, which of course said that i pi over e is equal to the limit as r approaches infinity of the integral from negative r to r of f of x dx plus the integral along gamma, which we've now shown just goes to zero. And so what this means is that we've said the integral from negative infinity to positive infinity of x e to the i x over 1 plus x squared with respect to x equals i pi over e. And let's not forget that to calculate the answer for sine, we have to take the imaginary value on both sides. And the imaginary part of this, of course, gives us sine x. And the imaginary part of i pi over e is pi over e. And so we've evaluated this, you know, seemingly really challenging and monstrous integral as just being equal to pi of e. Hope you guys have enjoyed this video. I know that some of the complex analysis techniques can be a bit fiddly, but that um, strategy, you know, of, of kind of just using inequalities and absolute values, just keeping going until you end up with something that definitely is zero, is always the way to go if you want to show or suspect that part of your contour is going to go to zero as you're taking some limit. Uh, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. And I hope you're looking forward to lots more stuff to come. Thanks again for 5,000 subscribers, and I'll see you soon. Bye.